Hello, everyone. In this chapter, let's discuss long-term assets. First, let me introduce to you the definition of long-term assets. Long-term, in accounting, it means we can use it for longer than one year or one operating cycle, whichever is longer. Assets represent the resource we can use to help us generate revenue. Therefore, long-term assets, these are assets which are expected to benefit us in future periods. We have two types of long-term assets. The first one, tangible assets. Tangible assets have, have physical substance. For example, property, plant, equipment, and natural resources. For example, if you have an equipment, you can use it to produce or to provide service to your customer. Therefore, you can benefit from using it. The second type of long-term assets is intangible assets. They don't have physical substance. For example, patent, franchise, copyright, or goodwill. Even though intangible assets don't have physical substance, we can still benefit from using them. For example, patent represents an exclusive right to provide service or to produce goods to your customer. Therefore, we can still benefit from using them. There are several accounting issues we are interested in for long-term assets. The first one, what should we do if you acquire a long-term asset? The second one, when you are using your long-term assets, how do you depreciate your long-term assets? The third one, what is the accounting treatment if you dispose of your long-term assets? The last one, if the fair value of your long-term assets dropped, what should you do? How do you impair your long-term assets? In this class, let's just discuss the first one, acquisition, and the second one, depreciation of long-term assets. Before we move to the acquisition of long-term assets, first, let's discuss the most important accounting principle, matching principle. Nowadays, we are using the accrual basis accounting system. It's about the recognition of revenue and recognition of expense. First question, when should we recognize revenue? According to realization principle, we should recognize revenue when it's earned. It means that when you provide service to your customers or when you deliver products to your customer, we think this is when you fulfill your obligations to your customer. Therefore, we should recognize revenue when it's earned. The second question, when to recognize expenses. According to matching principle, we should recognize expenses with related revenues. Matching principle means we recognize expenses in the same period as the revenues they help to generate. Assume that you want to provide cleaning service to your customer and you want to earn service revenue from your customers. Therefore, at first, you have to hire employees to work for you. So you incur salaries expense. And then you need to purchase supplies and use supplies. So you incur supplies expense. Here you can observe a cost and effect relationship between revenue and expenses. You incur cost to earn revenue. So we should recognize expenses with related revenues at the same period. This is matching principle recognize expenses in the same period as the revenues they help to generate. When we incur a cost, there are two accounting choices, to capitalize it or to expense it. Now, get, let me give you two cases and let's discuss how to make the accounting choice. Assume that in year one, you incur a cost of $100, but you can benefit from this $100 over the following 10 years. Now the question is, 
when should you recognize expense? In the first year or over the following 10 years? According to matching principle, we should recognize expenses with related revenues in the same period. This $100 can benefit us in the following 10 years. Therefore, we should recognize expenses over the next 10 years. Here is the journal entries we should record. In year one, when the cost incurred, we should first capitalize this $100 as our asset. This is a resource that can benefit us in future years. We debit asset $100 and we credit cash or payable $100. This is an entry in year one. From year one to year 10, assume that we equally allocate this $100. For each year, when we generate benefit, we should recognize related expense. So we debit expense $10 and we reduce our asset by $10. Here you can see, this is capitalization. When this cost can benefit us in future years, we should capitalize it at first and then expense it in the following years. The second case, if in year one you incur a cost of $100, but you can only benefit from this $100 in year one. Now the question is, when should we expense this $100? According to matching principle, we can only benefit from this $100 in year one. Therefore, we should recognize the entire amount as our expense in year one. Here you can see, in year one, when costs incurred, we debit expense $100 and we credit cash for payable $100. In future years, from year one to year 10, because we no longer benefit from this cost, there's no general entry recorded. Here you can see we have two accounting choices, capitalize it or expense it. It depends on how we are able to benefit from this cost. So now let's move to the acquisition of long-term asset. You incur a cost to purchase long-term asset. This can benefit you in future years. Therefore, for the cost, should we capitalize it or expense it? Of course, we should capitalize it as our asset. First, let's assume that you pay $1,000 as the purchase price to buy this long-term asset. So of course, the purchase price, we need to capitalize it. But sometimes we also need to pay other expenditures necessary to get this asset ready for use. For example, you have to pay the shipping fee or the tax. For those expenditures necessary, should we capitalize it or expense it? Even though it is a one-time expense, but if we incur this one-time expense, we can use this asset for longer than one year. So we have future benefits. If we don't incur this one-time cost, we cannot use it at all. Therefore, for those other expenditures necessary to bring the asset to its designed condition and location for use, we should capitalize it as well. So when you purchase a long-term asset, how to record the cost of this long-term asset? There are two parts you need to include. The first one is the purchase price you paid. The second part is all expenditures necessary to get this asset ready for use. Let's use the acquisition of land as an example. First, to purchase this land, you pay the purchase price, which is $500,000. So of course, you have to capitalize it. In addition to the purchase price, you have to pay other expenditures necessary. For example, commission fee, $30,000. Back property taxes, $6,000. Title insurance, $3,000. And assume that when you purchase the land, there is an old building on it. If you want to use this land for your own operation, you have to incur a cost of $50,000 to remove the old building. 
So of course, this is a necessary expenditures. Assume that when you remove the old building, you have some salvage materials. You can choose to sell those salvage materials to another entity, and you receive $5,000. We put it as a negative number, because when you receive $5,000, that is to say you pay a lower amount to others to purchase this thing. Okay, so this is going to reduce the net cost of your long-term asset. And lastly, you incur a cost of $6,000 to level the land. Here you can see, in total, the purchase price is $500,000, but we incur additional expenditures. Therefore, the total cost of this land is $590,000. The journal entry to record the acquisition should be debit land $590,000 and credit cash $590,000. Okay, so now let's move to the second part, depreciation of long-term assets. What is depreciation? Remember in the first part, we discussed that at the beginning, when you incur a cost to purchase an asset, you should capitalize it as your asset, right? Assume that this asset can give you future benefits. Like the case I give to you, you can generate benefit in year one, year two, year three, and year four. According to matching principle, we should recognize an expense in each year, right? We should match the recognition of expense with the recognition of revenue. So this is depreciation. In dictionary, depreciation means the decrease in value of an asset. But in accounting, it's a little different. It means the allocation of an asset's cost to an depreciation expense over time. Like the case here, we allocate the cost to the four years, which we can generate benefit by using this asset. Before we move to the calculation of depreciation, let's discuss some terminologies in depreciation. First one, accumulated depreciation. This is a contra-asset account representing the total depreciation taken to date. A contra-asset account means that its balance is on the contra side compared to asset account. An asset account, the normal balance is on the debit side. So a contra-asset account, the normal balance is on the credit side. This is going to reduce the net value of our asset. The second term, book value. This equals the original cost of the asset minus the current balance in our accumulated depreciation. Therefore, in our balance sheet, we're going to record our asset at its original cost, and then we record the counter asset account accumulated depreciation. We use original cost minus accumulated depreciation. We can calculate the net value. We call it as book value. Next one, service life or useful life. This represents how many years or how long you can use this asset to help you generate benefit. The last term, residual value or salvage value. That is to say at end of its useful year, you have salvage materials. So you can choose to sell the salvage materials to another entity and you can receive money from another entity. This is salvage value. When we incur depreciation expense, what is a journal entry? This is an example. Starbucks pays $1,200 for a computer. And the useful life is four years. We allocate the cost equaling over the four years. Therefore, for each year, we should depreciate this expense by 300. What is the journal entry? On debit side, we debit depreciation expense. For each year, we depreciate it for an equal amount, 300. On the credit side, we credit accumulated depreciation by 300. Here you can see, if we credit accumulated depreciation by 300, 
we reduce the book value of this asset from 1200, which is original cost, to 900, which is the net value. Here you can see, by recording this journal entry, instead of credit the asset account directly, we would like to credit the contra asset account. We have different methods to calculate the depreciation. First one, straight line method. Second one, declining balance method. And the third one, activity based method. Let's discuss them one by one. Straight line method is the most commonly used one. Around 95% of firms in the industry, they are using straight line method. Straight line method allocates an equal amount of the depreciable cost to each year of the asset's service life. We use asset cost minus estimated residual value divided by asset's service life. Let's use an example to show how to apply this formula. Here we have the data for Little King Sandwich's delivery truck purchase. The original cost of this long-term asset is $40,000. The residual value is $5,000. And in total, we can use it for five years. How to calculate depreciation expense for each year? First, you can see, depreciable cost is $35,000. This is calculated as the original book value, $40,000, minus the residual value, $5,000. Why it's $35,000? Because our objective is to reduce the value of this asset from $40,000 to $5,000. Therefore, in total, how much should we depreciate this asset? It should be $35,000. Next, we want to allocate this $35,000 over five years. We allocate an equal amount to each year. So we can use $35,000 divided by five years. Therefore, the depreciation expense for each year is 7,000. Or we have five years. You can think it as one over five. The depreciation rate is 20%. For each year, we depreciate it by 20%. You can see for first year, we debit depreciation expense 7,000 and we credit accumulated depreciation by 7,000. Now we reduce the book value of this asset from $40,000 to $33,000. We repeat the same procedure for year two to year five. You can see for each year, we recognize a depreciation expense of $7,000. And at the end of year five, we successfully reduce the book value from $40,000 to $5,000. This is straight line method. The second method we are discussing is double declining balance method. For this method, we assume that we're going to use more of this asset in earlier years, and we're going to use less in later years. Therefore, how do we depreciate this asset? We depreciate more in earlier years, and we depreciate less in later years. Let's take a look at the depreciation schedule. The formula to calculate depreciation expense under this method is different. We use the beginning book value for each year times the depreciation rate. For first year, what is the beginning book value? The beginning book value is the original cost, $40,000. And next, what is the depreciation rate? On the straight line method, the depreciation rate is 1 over 5, which is 20%. But here, this is double declining balance method. So we simply double the depreciation rate on the straight line method. So now it's 40%. In year one, we use $40,000 times 40%. The depreciation expense is $16,000. We debit depreciation expense for $16,000, and we credit accumulated depreciation by $16,000. Now we reduce the book value from $40,000 to $24,000. This is the ending book value, $24,000 in year one. 
In the second year, what should we do? Again, we use the beginning book value. Beginning book value of year two is the ending book value of year one, so we use it $24,000 times 40%. The depreciation expense for the second year is $9,600. We debit depreciation expense $9,600, and we increase our accumulated depreciation by $9,600. Now the total depreciation is increased to $25,600, and we reduce the book value to 14,400. We repeat the same procedure for year three and year four, but in year five, let's pay attention to the calculation. At end of year four, the book value is 5184. If we apply the same procedure, we use 5184 times 40%. We're gonna depreciate this asset for around $2,000 and we're gonna reduce the book value to $3,000. There is a problem because we estimate that the residual value is 5,000. If we depreciate it by 2,000, we're gonna reduce the ending balance to a price lower than the residual value. Therefore, in the last year, we should use another way to calculate it. If you take a look at the beginning book value at year five, it's 5184. And then our objective is to arrive at its residual value, which is 5000 based on our estimation. So how much should we depreciate this asset in year five? It's the difference between them, 184. So here on the double declining balance method, you have to pay attention to the formula. We are using beginning book value times depreciation width. And then you have to pay attention to the depreciation expense in the last year. You need to observe the beginning book value and the residual value. The last method we are discussing is the activity-based method. Assume that the actual miles driven in year one to year five were 30,000 miles, 22,000, 15,000, 20,000, and 13,000. Step one, let's calculate the depreciation rate per unit. We use depreciable cost divided by total units expected to be produced. The depreciable cost is 40,000 minus 5,000, which equals 35,000. That is to say, in total, we should depreciate this asset for 35,000. And then we estimate that in total, we're going to drive this truck for 100,000 miles. So we use 35,000 divided by 100,000 miles. We can have the depreciation rate. It's 35 cents per mile. That is to say for each mile we drive this car, we should depreciate it by 35 cents. Now in step two, let's look at the depreciation schedule. In year one, we have driven this truck for 30,000 miles. So 30,000 miles times 35 cents per mile. That is to say the depreciation expense is $10,000 and 500. We debit depreciation expense by 10,500 and we credit accumulated depreciation 10,500. We apply the same procedure for year two to year five. You can see the more we drive this truck, the more we depreciate it. That's why we call it as activity-based. If you make a comparison between different methods, you can see. For streamline method, we depreciated for 7,000 for each year. But under double declining balance method, we depreciate more in earlier years, and we depreciate less in later years. The depreciation expense is decreasing over time. For activity-based method, the depreciation expense is fluctuating. It's very high in first year, and it's relatively higher in year two and year four, and it's relatively low in year three and year five. It depends on how we use this asset. But overall, you can see the total depreciation is always $35,000. So no matter what method we're using, in total, we depreciate this asset for $35,000.
the only difference is how we allocate this $35,000 over different years. Okay, we have finished the topic of acquisition and depreciation. If you still have any question, you can leave a comment or email me. I will reply you as soon as possible. Thank you for listening. Bye.